finding time to be a part of the international webinar series Vikery 2021. All good things start with the touch of God. So let us start this session with a prayer. Oh God, without whom we can do nothing, bless us with your aid so that we may get wisdom and grace from our studies this day and always. Amen. Thank you, Nia. Now I would like to invite the HOD of Zoology Department, Professor Priya Thomas, for the welcome speech. A warm good afternoon to all present for today's webinar. Vikery, the international webinar series of BCM College, is meant to disseminate knowledge among people in all spheres of life. It has been envisioned to impart an update about researches happening worldwide in a multidisciplinary manner. It's my pleasure to introduce and welcome our speaker for today, Dr. Aishwarya Girija, for the international webinar conducted by the Department of Zoology, Bishop Chulaparambil Memorial College, Kotem. Speaking about Dr. Aishwarya, she is currently doing her second postdoctoral research as Mary Curie Individual Postdoctoral Fellow at the Institute of Biological, Rural and Environmental Sciences, Aberystwyth University, Wales, United Kingdom. Before joining here, she did her postdoctoral study at Michael Galilee Research Institute, Israel. She has finished a doctoral degree in plant biotechnology from Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotechnology at DBT Institute at Trivandrum, Kerala. She has been awarded prestigious fellowships like European Union Marie Curie Individual Postdoctoral Fellowship, UK Stapleton Trust Travel Fellowship, Serb NPTA Fellowship, Newton Baba PhD Fellowship, and DSD Inspired Doctoral Fellowship. She has published numerous research papers in reputed peer-reviewed journals and has also presented papers at various national and international conferences. I'm very much privileged that you have accepted our invitation despite your busy lab work. I'm also happy to mention that we share a bond of friendship from Rajiv Gandhi Center. She could have had a well-settled life of a postal employee at a very young age but her curiosity and passion for research brought her today at where she stands. Once again, I wholeheartedly welcome Dr. Aishwarya for the talk. At this juncture, I would like to welcome Dr. Steffi Thomas, a principal, Dr. Anu Thomas, vice principal, and Reverend Father Philmon Kalatra, Secretary of College of Education, Kotem Arkipaki and all the department heads to the webinar. I would also like to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Basil and Ms. Emmy Matthew, all my colleagues, teachers, and students from other college, and all my dear students to this webinar. Once again, I welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you, Priyamis, for the warm welcome. So let's kick off today's webinar on sowing new grains for the future, an Ethiopian tiny grain teff. We have an amazing resource person for today's session, Dr. Aishwarya Girija. She is currently doing her second postdoc as Mary Curie Individual Postdoctoral Fellow at the Institute of Biological, Rural and Environmental Sciences, Aberystwyth University, Wales, UK. Ma'am, it's an honor for me to invite you for this session. The floor is all yours. Thank you. Um, so shall I share my screen now? Bear with me a minute. Can you see my share a screen? Yes, ma'am. Uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so uh, before I begin, uh, good evening everyone. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, the principal of PCM College, Dr. Steffi Thomas, and also uh, the head of the Department of Zoology, Professor Priya, for giving me an opportunity and invite me, inviting me to share my uh, research 
ideas and experience in your international webinar series. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. So uh, good evening, everyone, again. The topic uh, for my today's uh, talk is on sowing new grains for the future, an Ethiopian tiny grain theft. So before I begin, I would like to give a brief introduction of my background. So already uh, Priya has um, uh, explained it very well. Explained very well. So I am basically a plant biologist. I did my PhD from Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotechnology uh, in Kerala. And after my PhD, I was um, further pursued my first postdoctoral research in Israel. So it was during that period, um, the, the opportunities, the, you know, after the PhD, what are the further opportunities you have uh, to further build your uh, research career? It really opened up uh, when I did my postdoctoral research in Israel. So at that time, uh, I applied for this very prestigious Europe and competitive European Marie Curie Fellowship to do my further postdoc in UK. So that's how I uh, joined here in IBUS. And this is my second postdoc, and I'm currently working in uh, TEF, which is a crop plant. So further, I will explain further more about TEF uh, during my, uh, in my further slides. Uh, so for the beginning, I will give you an introduction about the university where I'm currently working in, and then what are the facilities we have in the university. And then I will give you an introduction about the X crop, which I'm working, what are the uh, opportunities, uh, what are the uh, limitations of that crop, and what are the developments, and how we are applying the omics facilities in order to improve this grain. And then finally, I would like to give you some of the opportunities for the students that who want to do masters or further research in UK, I want to give you a small, uh, it's small um, discussion about how we can apply for the fundings, what are the scholarships that are available to do further studies in UK. So I'm sure most of you might not have heard this name of this university. So we are Aberystwyth University. So we are uh, located in Wales in the United Kingdom. So if you look at the map, here we are. This is Wales and we are located in the Western uh, West Wales. So we are called Aberystwyth University. So we are the top university in Wales and we have been ranked as one of the best university for student satisfaction in the year 2020. So this is the whole university campus. As you can see in the picture, this is our university campus. And within the university, the department, the department which I am working currently, it's called Institute of Biological, Environmental and Rural Sciences or IPERS. So IPERS is one of the largest department or institute within the university. And within IPERS, uh, we have lots of facilities. So one of the major aim or not aim, I would say the major long term goal of our department of IBUS is to address the global challenges that affect the plant, animal and human health. So what we are aiming is how we can deliver a healthy environment, healthy people, healthy plants and healthy uh, animals. So for this, we have a high enormous facilities in order to study the plant system. We have the National Plant Phenomic Center, and then we have a vet school, which is Aberystwyth School of Veterinary Science for studying the animal systems. And then we have the high throughput omics facilities in order to study more advanced researchers in terms of genomics to transcriptomics and metabolomics. I would like to give you a little more uh, detail about what are the facilities or what we offer in these um, in these uh, centers. So uh, this is called National Plant Phenomics Center. So I am a plant biologist. So for a plant biologist, one of the uh, difficult tasks is to understand how a plant responds to environment. For example, like you want to study how a rice plant uh, is behaving in a very hot environment or hot climate, very cold climate, how uh, the plant is, um, is how the plant is able to adapt 
to these stress conditions. So it's very difficult for a plant researcher to understand the plant system because one thing is plant system is really complicated. It's not that easy because plant respond in a very different way and to different conditions. For example, the plant will be behaving differently in the field, like in the farm, but it will be different. It, it will be behaving differently in a control conditions. So for a plant researcher, one um, task or the one major task is how you can understand the plant system without getting any uh, errors from these external factors. Like if you're considering a plant growing in the field, uh, it will be affected by the rain, the wind, the temperature fluctuations, the soil nutrients. So it's very difficult to understand the plant system, you know, the response of the behavior of the plant, what exactly are the networks or the gene regulatory networks associated with the plants that helps the plant to adapt or survive. So first for the plant researcher, what we want is we want a controlled environment. So here in plant phenomics facility, as you can see in the image, we have a very large facility to monitor the plants under controlled conditions. So here everything is controlled, the watering, the light, temperature, and then you can grow your plants and you can understand the plant growth development or even if, if you want to study like how a plant respond to various uh, stress conditions like drought, uh, like high uh, temperature. So you can set up the experiment in this, in our facility, and you can monitor the behavior of the plant. So that is called phenomics. So when you hear the term phenomics, even if it's animal, even if it's plant, or even if it's human, how we are, like for example, I have black hair, and then some people have red hair. So that is the color difference. That color difference or the phenology, that is called phenomics. How a plant, how an animal, how a human look, the whole, the, how we look outside, that is phenomics. Because everything that is happening inside will be eventually reflecting in the our outside phenomic traits. So here, this is for the plant phenomics facility, what we have in phenomics center. So we have very large platforms. One, we have a small platform which can hold about 2000 plants. And the second platform is a large plant for growing a higher crop, crop plants. So where it can hold around 800, 880 plants. And then uh, you can see every, each plant is in pot. So you can grow the plant in the pot and then everything is imaged. So this is one of the image obtained from this facility. So not everything is computerized. So when you grow the plant, it will automatically image the plant at various stages so that you can get you can get all the phenomic observation of the plant. For example, the leaf area, the plant height, leaf color, the root structure. So without destroying the plant. And then apart from that, you will also get the environmental data, like the temperature, the light, humidity, what, how much water the plant is using. So all that can be obtained from this facility because everything is computerized, everything is automated. You have to grow the plants under control conditions and then it automatically, the data will be obtained. And then it is easy for you to understand how each plant responds to differently in a different environment. So that's the phenomics facility we have. Apart from this, what we have is we have an advanced imaging facility. So now you have to learn more about the grain structure or the stems texture. For example, if you want to understand the rice seed, more uh, in-depth in analysis of the rice seed, the size, color, the internal structure. Here we offer advanced imaging facilities using a visible infrared and micro CT scanner system. So this is some, some of the images which have been captured using our image facility. So that's we have for our plant, uh, plant uh, research, uh, for the plant research. <clears throat> and now, uh, next we have an Abristwit School of Veterinary Science. So today, <coughs> sorry, so today, actually today we have opened the first batch of students for the bachelor's veterinary science. So, uh, give me a minute, sorry. <clears throat> so here in Abristwit University, we have started the first 
School of Veterinary Science in Wales. And that is in collaboration with Royal Veterinary College. So today is uh, we have started actually the course of students has come up for the first batch for veterinary science. So here it is a five year program. And during this program, five year program, you have three years, you have an opportunity to train at Royal Veterinary College and also in our university. So uh, if you, also here we have our own farm, like we have like our own lab, university farm facilities where you grow our animals, cattle, and pets so that you can study more about the animal system. Sorry, I'm getting a bad cough. <coughs> okay. So next I mentioned that <clears throat> we have a high resolution omics facility. So when you say that you are doing research in omics facility, you, know, you need to have a high throughput or high resolution omics platform to study more in depth detail. So now you have a good system of understanding a plant uh, behavior. You have a good system of studying the animal behavior. Now we have to look at the insight, how these things are happening or changing at the cell level. So you have observed the changes outside. Now how you are, how things are changing at the cellular level. So here we have a high throughput metabolomics facility. So what? So uh, before I explained phenomics. So phenomics means you are having an idea of how a plant or animal behave externally. So now metabolomics is like we are going intern inside at the cellular level. So metabolomics means a study of metabolites, or metabolites are small compounds that have specific role in the growth, and development, and adaptation of the. Uh, plants, animals, or humans. So here we have high resolution metabolomics facility where you can screen the whole metabolites within the sample. For example, if you want to study the protein profile, you have the proteomics facility. If we want to study the lipids, we have the lipidomics facility. So all these omics facility help us to understand the network associated with the system, which helps the plant or animal to respond or how they are behaving, how they are adapting, or what are the networks associated with the growth and development of the plant or animals in detail or in depth. So now uh, coming to my research. So I am a plant uh, biologist and uh, my basic research interests are to understand the crops and how the plants are behaving to the environment, how they are adapting and how we can improve the crop yield to feed the increasing global population. So when you are looking at the current challenge, the two main current challenge that are faced by the humankind or mankind, I would say, is the climate changes and the food insecurity. So we have a growing population and how we are going to feed the growing population. For example, it's not, it's not just you are feeding them, you have... So how you can... Um, feed the growing population. So when you say a population of a human population is increasing, then you have an increase in food demand. So at the same time, this food demand is compromised yeah. by the climate change and crop productivity. Okay, so you have the climate changes, climate changes that will affect the crop and which eventually result in less crop yield. So it is estimated that by 2030, there will be a reduction in the crop. So if you say crop, the major crop that we are currently depending for food are wheat, rice, and maize. So it is estimated that these crops cannot survive in the harsh or cannot survive in the changing environment, and there will be a shortage of uh, yield. So how you can maintain this food security? So one solution is that you can improve the wheat, rice, or maize by breeding or genetic manipulation. But this is not feasible, okay? Because it takes time. And then uh, by genetic, genetic manipulation, you mean transgenic lines or genetic, genetically modified GMO plants, which are not accepted by the consumers or by the society. So what is an alternate solution? So there comes the term orphan crops. So as I say, orphan crops, um, if you say within our plant community, there are about 20,000 edible plants. But within that 20,000, we are only consuming about 20% of the crops for our human 
consumption. The remaining crops are neglected. Why they are neglected? Because these crops, they also are highly nutritious. They can adapt to extreme environmental conditions, but still they are given less attention or they are not much utilized. So that class of crops are called orphan crops. So my focus is on orphan crops. So I would say these orphan crops are a group of plants that lie uh, on the side, ne lie on the neglected side of food security and climate change because these can be sources of human food, animal food, and also these can be can be sources for uh, the raw materials for the biofuels, and also it can survive or adapt to extreme environments. So some of the orphan crops are cereals. For example, the cereals, the major cereals you have are the rice, wheat, and maize. So the orphan crop uh, cereals are millets. For example, pearl millet, bajra, finger millet, ragi, which some of you might be most familiar, and we are using rag ragi. But again, there are more millets, like foxtail millet, little millet, and teff. And there are also pseudo cereals, quinoa, buckwheat. So quinoa, I think it's getting more popularity and people know about quinoa nowadays because it's considered as a super, uh, super food. Then other orphan crops are chickpea, uh, legume families, root crops, our tapioca, sweet potato, fruits like uh, okra, moringa. So these are that category of crops which we use but it is not gaining that much attention by the researchers or by the agriculture sector. It has been neglected. So my idea is how I can improve this orphan crop. So for my research, I have chosen teff. So teff is an Ethiopian cereal crop. So teff belong to the family of uh, wheat and rice because it's a cereal, it belong to the cereals, so, but it has come from Ethiopia. So in Ethiopia, teff is a staple food and it is one of the most important grain for the Ethiopian farmers. In, in Ethiopia, they cultivate teff for about three hectares of land, and it also supports the economy of the Ethiopian, Ethiopian farmers. So teff, uh, as you see in the image, these are the grains, teff grains. You have different varieties. Uh, they have like red or brown teff or uh, white teff. So if I say teff, you can... Uh, like if have you if you have seen draggy grains it is much smaller than that it is the smallest grain in the world so the word teff it's scientifically its scientific name is eragrostis teff it belongs to the eragrostis genus and within within this genus teff is the only crop that is used for human consumption so as i said teff is originated from ethiopia and the word teff has come from the amharic word tefa which means lost why lost? Because teff is a, has the smallest grain in the world, and because of its seed small size, small seed size, it is being lost during the yield or before the maturity. It is now been also cultivated in some parts of India, Australia, US. Uh, so here, this is an Ethiopian uh, lady who is preparing injera. So injera is this flat uh, bread. So it is more similar to our appam or dosa, I would say. So what they do in Ethiopia is they grind the teff grain to flour and then they ferment it. And then it will, they make an injera, which is a pancake like bread. So this is the staple or the daily bread of Ethiopians. And then the teff plant, uh, the teff straw, it is also used as an animal food due to high digestibility. So this uh, is where the teff is. So as you can see, see the size of the teff, how small they are. This is a rice, poppy seeds, it's much, made, but much smaller than that. So the size is an average about 1 to 1.5 millimeters. And they're very tiny, but they come in different colors. They have like in red or brown and they're white varieties. So the white uh, varieties are the most preferred one because they have been exported to other parts of the world, like Europe and US, because the white color teff can be mixed with other flour, like maybe with the wheat flour and other, and it can be used for bread and other uh, baking. And the red and the brown teff is mostly used by the Ethiopians in the local concept for the local consumption. So, but they are rich in iron and calcium. So now I will uh, talk, uh, talk about the benefits or what are the important nutritional significance and agronomical value traits of teff. 
Okay. So what are the nutritional significance of teff? So if you compare teff with other major crops like wheat, maize, rice, oats, or wild rice, quinoa, or other millets, the teff is highly nutritious and it's very healthy. So the teff grains are gluten-free. So there are some people who have gluten intolerance. They can't eat gluten. So teff is a supplement, it's an alternative uh, for those people. Also, the teff grains have low glycemic index or they have like slow digestible starch so that they can be used for even by diabetic patient. And when you compare the nutritional profile of teff with other crops and other orphan crops, the teff is high in protein, amino acids, fiber, and also it is a rich source of essential minerals like vitamin B6, calcium, copper, iron, magnesium, manganese, and it also can it is it is it it can be also supplement or it can all it can be an alternative to wheat and rice or other cereals that we consume. So now TEF is gaining more uh, interest within the European market and US because of its health benefits, because it's gluten-free and is high in protein, fiber, and also high in minerals. So this is highly nutritious, tiny grain that can be an alternative and also it can be used for human food or human consumption. Now, what are the agronomic traits? So, okay, tough grains are highly nutritious. So now what, how the plant is, whether it can grow in a high, a hot climate, whether it can grow in water logging conditions. So yes, teff is a resilient crop. So teff, as it comes from Ethiopia, it can grow in a very wide range of geographical conditions. Also, it is more tolerant or it is more adaptive to drought and also it can grow in high water logging conditions. So in a place where you where a wheat, rice or maize cannot survive, you can grow teff. So while growing teff, it's just not a plant. The grains can be used as a human food and also the teff straw. Straw means the leaves or the upper portion of the plant. You can use as an animal food. So it's a dual crop. I would say it's a dual crop, dual purpose crop. It can be human food and animal feed. But what are the limitations in TEF? So what are the limitation means? First of all, TEF is an orphan crop. Okay, so it has not got much attention by the researchers, like how you do research in wheat, rice. The TEF has not got that much attention and there is no knowledge or databases available for TEF. So to improve TEF or to bring more uh, uh, developments in TEF breeding programs, the first thing is you need to get more funding to do TEF research and also more researchers has to focus on improving this uh, kind of orphan crop. That is the first limitation. The second one is what are the other uh, technical limitations? The technical limitations are is size because TEF is very small. So sometimes it's very difficult to harvest so you will lose most of the yield and then it's very labor intensive. And second is lodging. So you see in the figure, this is a tough plant. So the tough has a very weak stem, okay, very weak stem. So it cannot stand or it cannot grow straight. Sometimes it tend to fall. So that falling of the stem is called lodging. It's called stem lodging. So the tough plants are more prone to lodging and you will you lose the yield or the seed due to lodging. And, you, and yield loss is mainly because of lodging and of a small seed size. So my focus is you have a potential of, this is like a very uh, potential crop that can be used for future in terms of when you're talking about food security, you don't have to completely depend upon wheat, rice or maize. There are lots of other crop which can supplement your needs. So TEF is one such uh, crop and my interest or focus is how you can improve TEF, how you can increase the value of TEF, how you can make the TEF more aware about of its nutritional or agronomic significance. So that's my research about. So as I said, this is an era of omics. Everything we work is through omics. So omics, we have different types of omics facility that we applied. So when I talk about omics, you can, you don't think about the plant system. You can also apply to any system, animal to humans. So this is the overall omics 
platform that we currently have in research. So phenomics is how an organism responds or behave and how it's how it looks. So that can be done by imaging or some sensor technology. So that is the phenomics, the phenotype. And then comes the genomics. Genomics at the DNA level by sequencing. And then the transcriptomics, how the genes are expressed uh, during the stress conditions or during the growth and development, transcriptomics. And then comes proteomics and metabolomics. The proteomics and metabolomics are the end product. So you have the external behavior. So the external behavior is due to the internal uh, behavior or what are the things happening in internally within the cellular level. So you look at the genome level, you look at the gene level, and then you look at the metabolite level. So also you can go by, you can either go from this direction to metabolomics, or you can look at the metabolomics and then go back to phenomics. So first you will study the metabolomics uh, or metabolom of a organism. For example, in TEF, I will study the metabolite present in TEF. And then I will try to correlate to the genome and the phenotype. So these are the whole omics facilities or the omics platform that we currently have in the research field. So as I said, uh, the whole phenotype is completely dependent upon environment and then to genotypes. So it's all three are interconnected. The way you look is completely dependent upon where you live and how it's what is happening and how you are regulating within the gene so all these three are interconnected in any system whether it's plant animal or human so my idea is how to connect a metabolome to phenotype so as i said metabolite are small compounds that are responsible or regulators for the growth development and adaptation of the plant or any organism as I, when I say plant, you can imagine to your animal system or any system. So you have like primary metabolites in plants and secondary metabolites. So primary metabolites are, most, uh, are more specifically for the growth and development, like carbohydrates, proteins, whereas secondary metabolites are like phenolic compounds, alkaloids, flavonoids, which, are, uh, which play a specific role in the adaptation or nutrition of the organism like maybe it will give antioxidant capacity maybe it gives some resistance to pathogen maybe it can help the plant to survive in very high hot climate cold climate or in limited water conditions so those metabolites so what i'm trying to do is my project is called super tough project so it has been funded by the horizon Marie Curie program so here i'm using TEF as a system to understand the basic biology or the mechanism, how the metabolites are uh, expressed in TEF. And when I say TEF, the whole population of TEF is very diverse, like humans. You know, we are very diverse. You, I am different from you. I look different from you or everyone. Everyone is different. Likewise, the TEF population is also very diverse. Some TEF plants are very tall, some TEF plants are short. Some, for example, the TEF seeds red, seed color are brown, some are white, and some are not lodging, some are lodging more. So I'm trying to understand why, what is the diversity? What makes the TEF population so diverse? So I'm trying to uh, do a metabolomics and genomics assisted way to understand the diversity within the population. So when you understand why one plant is different from the other plant, what is the exact reason you can understand what are the network or gene network associated with that uh, trait. And then you can use it for further breeding and tough improvement programs. So this is the overall idea of the super tough project. So this is the TEF at its maturity. So as I said, we have a large collection of TEF plants here. We have around 348 varieties. So I am trying to understand the metabolite profile of each plant. So if you say like this TEF will be different from this TEF, maybe this will be taller than this. So within this TEF population, they are so diverse. So I'm trying to use metabolomics, which is called metabotyping, to understand the metabolic diversity within the TEF population. 
and then after that i am using a genotyping then i am doing a sequencing for this 348 varieties and then i will try to understand or correlate the genome a uh, genome relation to the metabolite for example if a uh, if a tef variety is for example in this figure you have some tef variety which is tall and some short so i'll understand the mfs the metabolic difference between these varieties and then i will sequence them and then i will correlate that genome information with the metabolite and i will try to find out the targets or the candidates associated with this difference why this plant is tall and why this plant is short this is like phenomics you know you have the phenomics the difference and then why this plant is lodging why some are not lodging why this plant have more tillers and what is the difference in the seed color why that is red and brown what is the factor that controls all these traits so that can be found out from the genome assisted metabolite sequencing so that is the whole idea of super tef project so within this project we are trying to identify the ca uh, the candidates which can be further used to improve the tef maybe we can bring tef crop more lodging tolerant or maybe we can in or if we more maybe we can reduce the height of the tef so that it will not be lodged maybe we can improve the seed size or maybe we can increase the yield so that is how uh the basic uh, use a basic research that i'm trying to do with omics that is metabolomics phenomics and genomics so as i said we have always need new crops so it's not new they are not new actually these crops are there within our system so within our uh, like for example in kerala we have millets but we are not using millet so i can't say these are new crops we can say these these are crops which have been less utilized in our food system so they are highly nutritious so we can in, incorporate them into the into food system so that we will be able to maintain the balance and we can also be able to maintain or feed the growing human population without going to food insecurity or uh deficiency like because when you say rice when you compare rice millets or teff they are teff and millets are more nutrition than rice so you'll get more nutrients so it's it, it is possible to feed in a healthy way to the population for the growing population so my research is mainly to focus on these group of crops and how we can in, improve the awareness increase awareness to the public consumers and increase the value so that it will not only help to feed the population but also it will help the small scale farmers so it is like we are in, we are giving a revenue to our small scale farmers also thereby boosting our economy so teff is one such crop uh, that has so much potential because it's gluten free it can be a healthy food but it needs more attention so with this i'm uh, winding up my uh, research or science talk here i hope it was not boring and you got at least you you understood what are the neglected crops and why it is important and what is teff okay uh, so next i would like to give you um, some of the opportunities we have in uk so recently in uk if you are planning to do masters there are lots of opportunities um, for the students because uh, for the science graduates ex for example and we have lots of fellowship one such fellowship is commonwealth uh, master scholarship but now this scholarship is currently open and the deadline is 1st november so all these scholarship it will cover the tuition fees and also the living cost so another uh, scholarship which is currently open is chevening scholarship so students who are in the final year of the bachelors and who want to do uh, a, a study in uk why i'm not saying that uh, we have opportunities in india but when you go abroad and study you will get more idea your uh, your vision about your uh, career improves a lot 
so that's why for example when i was doing my phd i got a six month uh, in, actually i didn't know about the abristwood university when i'm doing my phd i have never heard about this university but during my phd in rgcb there was a program of uh, called newton bama fellowship and i applied that fellowship and through that fellowship i came here for six months to do my uh, the part of a phd work and during that time it gave me a lot of exposure you know how things are happening around the world what are the advanced uh, uh, techniques uh, how uh, we can include how we can apply these techniques you know in our, uh, our phd or the facilities or the resources we have in india because in india we have lots of natural resources india is the biggest country with that much resources but the thing is we are very sometimes very limited i won't say we are behind we are way advanced but sometimes uh, we lack that kind of applicability of these techniques to how to use these resources in a very better way in a very much how we get in a very better way that would benefit the human uh, human mankind or to the society so when you girls do studies in uk it gives you a more uh, vision about how you can work and it will broaden your ideas so if someone is looking for uh, to do masters in uk now or recently they have so many scholarships scholarships which are open now commonwealth chimney scholarship erasmus mundus and felix scholarship so you can check in this british council site and you see there are lots of uh, scholarship these are different universities in uk that offer for scholarship for doing master program and also in our university we also have uh, different uh, scholarship programs called aber grad scholarship programs global wales scholarship and also there are like international accommodation award where you where your uh, hostel fees will be covered and if you want to acquire masters in animal science livestock science environmental uh, or chem management there is commonwealth shared scholarship so these are some other fellowships which are uh, which can be applied for doing masters so recently uk government uh, has uh, changed the visa rules so if you are coming to uk to study for masters you can stay after your degree you can stay two more years so you can stay in uk for two more years and you can either leave uh, or work and also maybe you can work or you can do phd so the uk government has changed the visa regulation that is one of the great opportunity i would say for the students to come in uk maybe you can study and do work or even if you want can continue study by doing phd so if you are someone interested looking for doing masters in uk it is a right time uh, do check this fellowship because currently they are open and our uk intake usually happens in september and january so maybe you can apply for the january intake and start your masters program so please do go and have a look at this scholarship so with this i am winding up my uh, talk uh, for today's presentation finally i would like to thank my supervisor professor louis moore uh, my co supervisor ratan yadav and also professor john and dr fiona for the providing me the phenomics facility to do my research and thank you once again Thank you, ma'am, for this very insightful session. The session has definitely sparked a scientific vigor among us. Let this be the beginning of the quest for scientific knowledge and research opportunities. Now, I would like to thank. I would like to invite Professor Amy Matthews for the vote of thanks. Uh, just for a second, uh, if any of you have any doubts, uh, we can have a small interactive session uh, for the closing vote of thanks. So I'm sure some of you must have some uh, doubts regarding your uh, future studies. So there are students from both botany and zoology backgrounds. So anybody, uh, our speaker is like very open to questions. So you can have it. You can take another five minutes.
Uh, also, I would I, I would to add that uh, not only doing masters for the researchers, like if you're doing PhD abroad, uh, there is another option called Global Talent Visa because uh, the UK government is promoting more researchers from uh, developing countries or the third world countries to come and do research in uh, research in UK. So there is another. Uh, op so if you do masters. And then if you do PhD and or if you are trying after your PhD in India, you are trying to uh, come to UK, there is another option called Global Talent Visa. So that support the researchers. And with that visa, you can come here and do also, uh, you can also find job. So, they are, so for applying to that visa, you don't have to have a job at the moment. So I'm saying that there is a lots of option for science graduate. So if you are looking uh, you have scholarship that will pay your tuition fees and then cover all your expenses. So if you're passionate about more research in future, that is a great opportunity lying ahead. Okay. Okay, there's a question in chat box. Uh, so Peter, Peter Kemani, he is the HOD of Botany Department. Uh, I think his question is, I would like to know more about pollination and seed setting in TEF. Uh, TEF is a self-pollinating uh, self uh, plant and the average uh, life cycle for TEF is like a three to four months, but it entirely depends upon the climate conditions. And because in UK, it is more uh, cold weather. So in Africa or Ethiopia, it takes around like three to four months when it comes to the maturity or seed setting, uh, seed setting time. But in UK, when I grew the plants, it took around five, six months, it delayed. So now uh, we are trying to grow the plants in two different seasons, like in UK uh, summer and UK winter, and trying to find out if there is any uh, time uh, difference or the, in the setting up of the seeds. So the self-pollinating uh, with an average lifespan of three to four months. Thank you. So any more questions? Over to you, Ashlyn. Okay, there's one more question. Uh, Ma'am, what are the basic eligibility mm. criteria of a student to do a master's in UK? Just you need your first degree, your bachelor's. And maybe you have to do an IELTS uh, exam, like English qualifying, but that you have to just attain, I think, six overall score of 6.5. So it depends upon the scholarship. Sometimes the scholarship demands for the English uh, proficiency, sometimes don't. Maybe you will get an, uh, you have to prove that your medium of study was English, then it's okay. But bachelor's uh, degree, and then maybe an English proficiency. So if you look at, uh, if you can go through all the individual scholarship, they have different criteria. So it's go through each link. So you can either check at the British Council or also to the links which I have shared now, like the Commonwealth and the Achievening, which are currently open. So the basic is bachelor's and maybe an English proficiency. So they do prefer English proficiency, but yeah, but it depends upon the type of scholarship. Actually, I have a question. Like, uh... There were times like uh, people used to say basic science doesn't give much opportunity, like studying botany or zoology as undergraduate. No, I disagree. I disagree. So what's your uh, opinion? No, I completely disagree because 
I would say that uh, take uh, that graduating in basic biology, like even if it's physics, chemistry, biology, like botany or zoology, that is the best to be. So if you finish your uh, bachelor's in basic biology or your master's, in if you if you if you want to do further studies, you can diverse. I mean, you can choose even if you, for example, if you want to uh, uh, do biotechnology, it's possible. You can change the, uh, you can, or I would say you can specialize, but always uh, I would suggest to do the basic biology because that gives you more opportunities. You can switch the field. For example, if you are taking a plant biotechnology as I would say masters, sometimes it's, re or bachelors, like for example, microbiology, I don't know, now you have like bachelor, uh, degree bachelor degrees that specializes but if you do some specialized degree it's very restricted it gives you limited options but if you're doing basic biology that gives you a foundation and that gives you an opportunity to switch to any field you want so that's what i am i am um, suggesting my juniors <laughs> don't do um, don't go for like you know uh, technology technical degrees at least do your first degree in basic biology, like physics, chemistry, botany, and zoology, and then you can switch. But make your foundation strong in basic biology that will give you an opportunity to uh, I mean, specialize further in future. Uh, are there integrated programs like Masters and PhD, yes, they are integrated programs that depends upon the university uh, that you have to check in the university. The universities do provide a five-year program which couples uh, Masters and PhD, so there are. Sorry, Bria, I just answered uh, one question from the chat box. I hope the first answer was okay, was uh, answered your question. Yes, definitely. So there are a lot of uh, parents and students who are really doubtful about their what's future by taking basic no, 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 no. Basic biology, they have like lots of opportunities, lots of opportunities ahead. I never, I would never say go for, because you are not getting a foundation because even I'm talking about plant biology, plant biologist, when I do research, everything comes to basics. For example, like uh, like the Peter Manisers uh, as the pollination. So if you want to know about the pollination, you're not getting it from learning biotechnology. You have to learn the basic biology. In biotechnology, you're learning more about the uh, advanced level. So first you need to make your foundation strong. If you don't have a basic biology core strong, then you're not going to get it into that advanced. So everything is advanced. So if you're, if you're looking at the cellular or the molecular level, then you have to know about what is happening in the biology, how the system work. And I would always say, do basic biology. That is the best way if you want to do more uh, research or studies ahead. It gives you lots of options. Okay, there's one more very open-ended question. Like, uh, ma'am, could you please suggest a basic MSc program, which is again job-oriented after PSC zoology? And also, could you please tell where to check for the scholarship programs provided for the student by the universities? So first question, it's uh, uh, Jodis. So it it's your interest. So what, even if it's job, uh, even if you learn anything, if you have a passion or interest, then you will eventually get a job or you will achieve success. So uh, I would suggest that think what you want to do and then in any field, in any field, I would say, whatever you're learning, you have job opportunities. Okay, it's not like you are sitting, <laughs> sitting, uh, you, you, you will be sitting at home without doing anything. You will have job opportunities, but you have to have a real focus and interest. So after MSc program, like in zoology, maybe you can go for... for the scholarship programs, uh, British Council, uh, Commonwealth. Uh, then also, if you have any specific university of choice, you can look at the university site because they have individual uh, scholarship that will support international students. But 
British Council and Commonwealth are the two major sites that offers government funded scholarships. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we can come to the end of interactive session. Thank you once again, Aishwarya. And uh, over to you, Ashley. So thank you, ma'am, for this informative session. Now I would like to call upon uh, Assistant Professor Amy Matthew for the vote of thanks. We can come to the end of interactive session. Thank you once again, Aishwarya. And uh, over to you, Ashley. So thank you, ma'am, for this informative session. Now I would like to call a warm good uh, evening to all. Amy Matthew for Last the one now, we had an amazing lecture from Dr. Aishwarya Girija from IBRS UK, who inspired us to think out of the box. And we had a detailed discussion on the tough, nutritionally rich, gluten-free cereal grain and plant omics technology and super tough projects. And Really, it is a wonderful paradigm shift from other grains to this tough grain and uh, in boosting orphan crops to super grains. And thank you, Dr. Aishwarya, for sharing your insights and research and your valuable time with us. And you inspired us a lot. And you shared uh, the, the, all the uh, information about uh, scholarships also. I would like to extend our gratitude on behalf of our BCM College and Department of Zoology to Dr. Aishwarya. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to extend our gratitude to the management of BCM College for encouraging our academic growth uh, through this great venture. And we are thankful to uh, Reverend Father Alex Ekaparambil as well as uh, Reverend Father Philemon Kalthra uh, for always being a good support to us. A big thanks to Dr. Steffi Thomas, our principal, and Dr. Anu Thomas, our vice principal, who always stand before us with the right vision and direction. I'm indeed happy to thank our head of the Department of Zoology, Ms. Priya Thomas, and Dr. Elizabeth Basil for organizing such a wonderful session for us. And also extend our gratitude to uh, Jace and Manish, Manisha for the technical support given. And once again, I Thank. Um, I extend our thanks to all the teaching and non-teaching staff and participants, and especially the students of our Department of Zoology uh, for the support and for, for the participation and for the active discussions. And once again, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.